understand it fully appreciate my standing. Join us as we explore evidence-based practice, manual medicine, and sports science through the lens of movement, strength, performance, and overall health. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. David Johnson, neurosurgeon. How are we doing today? Thank you, guys. Thank you, Brogan and Stephen. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Looking awesome. forward to it. Yeah, I'm looking forward to some great conversation. I've been looking at your social media posts and uh, we've connected through originally, I think it was Dr. Andrew Locke, but we definitely have similar views on some very temperamental topics around the world when it comes to musculoskeletal yeah. issues. So I'm looking forward to getting into that. But I'll go ahead and just read out a little bit about you for our listeners so that people have a bit of an idea of who you are. Dr. David Johnson is a brain and spinal neurosurgeon and functional movement spine rehabilitation specialist who has had a pioneering role in the establishment of multidisciplinary spinal practices and a holistic care for neurosurgical patients in Brisbane, Australia. Dr. Johnson's interest in back pain led to the development of the Back Pain and Functional Movement Training Center in 2015, which has become an integral part of his clinical practice and increasingly recognized as a center of excellence for spine pain rehabilitation. Yes, he put a CrossFit box in a hospital. <laughs> <laughs> I did, I did. The paradigm shift in Dr. World, Johnson's yeah. professional career evolved as he came to understand that the massive majority of treatments for spine-related pain and disability were purely symptom-focused and ignored causation. His program, NeuroHab, is the only recognized program in the world that lays claim to purposely and progressively reversing the root cause disease of movement dysfunction that drives secondary back pain symptoms. Dr. Johnson prioritizes patient education around the four pillars of health, which he believes are quality nutrition, movement, sleep, and stress management. He believes that the modern medicine and governments must refocus on educating the general population about these four pillars of health. Once again, it's an absolute honor to have you on the podcast. Welcome, Dr. David Johnson. Very impressive. And uh, also intro to the co-host, Dr. Stephen Redmond. Really, it's Redmond, and he is the Tony Stark of chiropractic. That's his nickname, and we're going with that every podcast. Anyway, uh, we have many questions, Dr. David. Yeah, where, is... where do we start? There's so many, there's so many uh, stones to turn, isn't there? It really so, does um, feel like that. So um, hopefully you don't feel like we're just throwing questions at you, but me and Stephen uh, definitely have some uh, ideas on what we want to talk about. Your very kind intro there. Everything that you read out there to me sounds like just common sense. I continuously wonder why every clinician in the musculoskeletal rehabilitation industry doesn't sort of think think along those lines. Yeah. It's sort of weird that this has to be a paradigm that feels like it's going against the grain of convention. And as we spoke earlier, that what's kind of taught me that if you're going against the grain with your ideologies, you're probably actually doing something right in the world mm. of chronic disease. Yeah. Because the world of chronic disease is so bad that it's very very blatantly obvious that what we're doing is not working right so yep. if you're kind of going against a mainstream convention is preaching then you're actually probably doing something right but it's it's kind of hard work doing that day in day out it is yeah and it's so important that we have people at every level in the in the healthcare yeah. system or in the medical system that are that understand these paradigms or understand uh, these pillars of health, right? Because it can't just yeah. be the neurosurgeons or the coaches or the strength coaches or the PTs or the chiros or whatever it may be. Like we need to holistically come together. And that's what I love um, about mm. some of the uh, connections that we'll be making online because there's physios and chiros and PhDs and neurosurgeons and people are coming together agreeing on mm. one thing. And that is, hey, mm. people need to take notice of this movement dysfunction. And mm. that seems mm. to really be a, a term that you've actually coined and been running yeah. with. Well, it's it's a central tenet of medicine that we we address conditions not just with a symptom focus, right? So mm. um, if someone presents to us or presents to me with a headache, I don't just call that a headache syndrome. Yeah. I want to know why he's having a headache. And I don't just prescribe uh, Panadol or Nurofen uh, to, oh, he's, oh, that's wonderful. The headache's gone. But if, if I don't delve a little bit deeper and actually identify a diagnosis, because pain and uh, back pain in particular, 
I, I will see official medico legal reports, certifications, and and it'll be on the report diagnosis back pain. That is a wow. symptom. That is a symptom, right? Yeah. And yet the industry is quite happy to accept back pain as a diagnosis. Mm. And so, you know, after many, many years of looking after thousands of back pain patients, I then, it, you know, the penny dropped like it has for a lot of us um, that are, you know, in, in our sort of network of, of, uh, of thinking. Mm. It's like, well, what is the cause of the back pain? Yeah. And if you reverse engineer the problem, you, you finally realize it, it has to be a biomechanical cause. And if it's a biomechanical cause, it's very much related to the biomechanics of moving. And if the biomechanics of moving are dysfunctional, then we can label the disease movement dysfunction, primary disease that causes the back pain symptoms. And, and you can fill in a few little spaces in between that. Yeah. Um, but that also highlights that back pain is primarily a functional disease, not a structural disease. The structural symptoms that result occur secondary to the primary movement dysfunction. Mm. And that's kind of logical to me. Like, you know, if you drive your car very badly, you are going to hit a tree. Okay, so your skill of driving that vehicle is poor. That's a functional problem. You hit a tree, you now have massive dents in your car, which is a structural problem. Hmm. Okay, but, but the industry is quite heavily focused and biased towards removing the dents from your car, but not improving the driving, you know, in, in, in the analogy of musculoskeletal pain and, and back pain in particular. So you have this framework, right, of what you operate from now in terms of how you treat your patients and educate your patients. Mm -hmm. And we'll get into that a little bit more. But how did you, for one, how did you get into neuroscience? And then how did that that move into the functional movement space that you're in? And in between that, where did CrossFit enter as well? So oh, kind gosh. of three things. Yeah. It's really serendipitous, but um I mean, I, I'll, I'll take your listeners back a little bit. So over 30 years ago, um, started my, my medical training in uh, 1991. Okay, so studying medical science for over 30 years now. There you go. Um, graduated from med school, um, really enjoyed med school, really enjoyed an anatomy, physiology. Uh, that was fantastic. Didn't really enjoy the social medicine side of things and the and, and those aspects of med school, but love the core sciences okay and so that kind of pushes you in towards this surgical field of medicine okay there's so many that's which is why medicine is such a fantastic um, specialty um, because it opens the window to lots of things you know radiology pathology if you love sitting in a lab or uh, looking down a microscope you can do that for the rest of your career if you love yeah. sitting in a dark room looking at x-rays you can do that for the rest of your career um so you know, having a really strong interest in anatomy and physiology and biomechanics, it kind of drew me towards surgery um, mm. uh, because you kind of get that instant satisfaction and I, I like instant gratification. So um, when, you, when you do an operation on someone who has significant structural problems and you, you fix that structural problem, mm. you kind of get that very immediate uh, reward and the patients experience that very immediate reward. You know, if you've got a, a nerve that's squashed and giving them terrible sciatic pain and foot drop or something, the next day when the patient's up and about walking, he goes, hallelujah, thank you, doctor. You know, it took a little while for me to realize that I was treating the secondary structural problem that's only half the job is done, right? So now I go back, I say to the patient, okay, I've done, I've done half the job, but now we've got to go and get rid of your movement dysfunction which created the disc prolapse in the first place. Otherwise, guess what's going to happen? You're going to get another disc prolapse or you'll get a re-herniation or the disc above is going to herniate. Okay, so that's that's the paradigm shift that took me a long time to learn. But then um, I stumbled into the, the field of neurosurgery, um, you know, and our training is quite extensive. Lots of brain surgery, spine surgery. Um, got my fellowship and then uh, worked in public hospitals for a long time and then decided to start my private practice. And when you get out into private practice land, you kind of just see the demand just follows you. And the demand was immediately evident. 
mm. that spinal disease was massive. Like I would, I would in in a week of seeing patients, I might see one or two uh, cranial issues, um, but the rest, wow. you know, ninety nine percent of the week was filled with predominantly back pain, and then you know maybe twenty percent cervical thoracic pain, but all of the work was coming through was back pain, back pain, back pain. Um, and then say I saw, um, uh, and I did this, that's a little while ago, every 20 patients that I saw, one of them could be considered to have a structural issue that would justify the risks of surgery. Okay. So the other 19 patients wow. who I would have gone, you, you definitely don't need surgery. You don't have a structural problem that justifies the invasive risks of spinal surgery to address your issue. So those 19 people would have been floundering in the rehabilitation world yeah. for a very long time before they came to a surgeon, okay? Because generally seeing a spinal surgeon is not the first port of call that a patient addresses. They will go and see their local corner store physical therapist. They'll try Pilates. They'll go to their acupuncturist. They'll do lots of things. They'll try different pain medications. They'll, you know, musculoskeletal physicians because they're not going to cut me open. Um, pain specialists, they're not going to cut me open. So they sort of, I'll go and see them first because yeah. the last thing I want to do is have a scalpel on my back. So by the time they got to a surgeon, um, these guys have got years behind them. And for them to see me and me go, your back's not that bad. It doesn't need anything. I can't, I can't be sitting there saying, well, just go back and do what you've been doing for the last five years because we know it's not working anyway, but sorry, you don't need surgery. You've got to offer those patients something that is different to what they've already tried. Yeah. Okay. And then I started asking the question. So tell me, and I used to spend a long time saying to patients, well, let's list off everything you've done. Let's really in detail. So you go to your, your physical therapist. Tell me what you do when you walk in there, you say hello to the receptionist, um, you swipe your, your, your uh, credit card, and then you walk into their studio. Tell me what you do from minute to minute, okay? And it was always, every, and even now, like, I still ask that question. Mm. Um, and, and the first thing that they do is they lay down on a, on a couch or they lay recumbent and they, they start to get the manual therapy and the, where is the upskilling? How many minutes of your session is dedicated to upskilling your biomechanics for mm. spinopelvic movement? And they just look at, they just look at me and go, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? And by this stage, I've already assessed their spinopelvic movement when they get out of the reception waiting chair. And when they walk into my office yeah. and they walk up the stairs and they sit down in another chair and I've already seen them pick up their handbag or their, their briefcase or whatever it is, or put their mobile phone down on the coffee table. I've already, the consultation's already started, right? I've already yeah. started to observe them and I can see that their biomechanics are horrendous. And I, it's a kind of a rhetorical question because I know that they have not received any form of movement therapy. Uh, but that's kind of when the penny started dropping was that the industry is completely distracted away from a functional intervention of upskilling movement proficiency. So how did CrossFit get into that? Well, the serendipitous part of all of this was that as a, as a physically active person, mm. um, and doing a lot of exercises, trail running. You know, I've got a, a national title in trail running. I used to surf, play golf. I was very physically active. And I started to get back pain myself. And then I, I serendipitously started um, doing Olympic weightlifting. Okay, so when I, first, when I had my first Olympic weightlifting class, my coach gave me a broomstick and said, show me how you do an overhead squat. Okay. And my overhead squat, just looked like I was <laughs> collapsing down and folding, <laughs> folding down into yeah. some, you know, little, uh, just invalid. <laughs> and she said, Whoa, that's not very good. I said, but that's like, I can't do it. So I immediately knew that in order to lift these barbells and heavy weights, and it didn't matter what it was, if you were, if you were in the Olympic weightlifting and the strength 
training field, the biomechanics of doing those movement tasks was absolutely critical. Yeah. And so yeah. if those biomechanical movement tasks were critical for lifting heavy loads, why, why would they not also be critical for doing trivial things of daily living? Absolutely. And so then the connection came, became Let's apparent. See. Okay, so that's how you do a deadlift. That's how you do a squat. That's how you do an overhead squat. Those biomechanics, if I can train those biomechanics into my patients, even though they're just bending over to brush their teeth or empty the dishwasher, then I'm enhancing their functional movement skills. Yeah. And what does that result in? That results in a reduction of biomechanical stress on the spinal motion segments. Mm. If I reduce biomechanical stress, I reduce biological inflammation. If I reduce biological inflammation, I reduce the progressing accelerated structural deterioration of a joint and I reduce pain and disability. That's how the concept of cause-based rehabilitation was derived. And that's how the term movement dysfunction has become central in my fine practice and then i had to go to the lengths of bloody uh developing my own rehabilitation services because i just yeah. I couldn't i couldn't send anyone to a specialized rehab service that taught people how to move so i often say to steve i have friends and family asking me when i go to refer i'm like oh man i where do i send you? Yeah. i don't know where to send them and Really, like I started this journey because I remember my brother was seeing a Pete, a personal trainer. I remember yeah. I was strength coaching him with the main movements. He was going for to a Cairo for adjustments, and he was seeing a, a physio. I remember thinking, man, like to kind of just angle this to you for a second, Stephen. Hearing what Dr. David was saying, how does that kind of jive with you being a chiropractor? Because, man, how important is it for you to be integrating that movement based stuff? beyond just the pain modulation. And I know you do. And that's why I'm asking you the question. How do you do it with such little time? <laughs> because I think McGill has three hours. I think I've heard Dr. David say he has 45 minutes on another podcast. Um, and I know sometimes you probably like, what are your thoughts on that, Stephen? So I want to first just acknowledge the fact that we are all three in completely different countries and we all see the same deficits, which is to be very eye-opening to people that regardless of where you go in the world, you don't really get a functional approach to healthcare. Yeah. And that's a huge detriment to society. Mm. And so going back to what Brogan was asking, I, I don't always have the most amount of time. I, my average visit is usually about 25 minutes that's starting to become most popular time frame that patients come in. So I start, I was just talking to a patient, my last patient of the night tonight, they were asking like, how do you see these movement dysfunction? I was like, because I see how you're moving when you walk in, I sit you down, I take you through some movements actively, passively. I do my interventions and then I go check again. Cause if I think I fixed something, but I didn't find out if I fixed it, I don't know that I fixed it. So my sessions always begin with movement, always end with movement. And when there is an actual injury, we have steps to take to upscale them, as you were mentioning. And I get so excited when I get to go to the next level, to the next level. Sometimes the patient's right there with me and our brains are in sync. They're like, so when are we going to do? And I'm like, we're actually getting ready to do that right now. And they get really excited because they were expecting to have to ask for instead of knowing that their clinician is going to take them through the motions to help them get better. Hmm. Yeah. I, Stephen, I think I'm so glad to hear that. Unfortunately, I think, um, I think that your approach to chiropractic therapy is not the mainstream of the industry. Most patients that, uh, that I've seen who have had chiropractic therapy and, and a lot of them do, and it makes them feel better. But the chiropractor has just left out one important step um, as part of his overall management is, is talking to them about the importance of biomechanics. Yep. Um, and I, and I, I don't criticize any patient for seeking out symptom-based interventions. Okay. So if, if someone gets a massage or if someone gets a deep tissue release or if someone gets an adjustment and it makes them feel better, 
that's wonderful. That's great. That's just the same as me prescribing uh, a, a high potency analgesic, right? Yep, exactly. But you can't just stop there. That's the first page of the management. And if all of our, if all of our physical therapists, it doesn't matter what background they have, osteopathy, chiropractic, mm. exercise physiology, uh, physiotherapy, you know, it, as, if we just added that extra 15 minutes into the consultation and said, hey, what I've just done is a symptom-based intervention, but now we have to give you a cause-based intervention. Otherwise, I'm doing nothing more than band-aiding the problem. And it will come back. You'll be sore tomorrow. You'll be sore next week. Um, and, um, and the biomechanics is, the fundamentally, is fundamentally the most important factor that determines joint health. Mm. it's so profoundly obvious like you don't need to do a randomized control trial to to know <laughs> the, the biomechanics i mean just go walk walk around for half an hour with your ankle turned inwards yeah okay? so, like walk around for half an hour like a duck and tell me what your ankle's going to feel like in half an hour because that's dysfunctional biomechanics it's dysfunctional yeah. movement for your ankle it's going to get massively inflamed and and it's just illogical to go, oh, okay, I'll give you a neurofin for that inflamed ankle and don't tell you to walk normally again. That's effectively what we're doing in the musculoskeletal industry is we're just treating the symptoms and not telling people to walk normally again. It's funny because when you listen to Stuart McGill, he, he says that he's had a few people come out in Canada to see him in person who have had... Uh, kind of strong ideas or ideologies around biomechanics not being important. And mm. he's, he's uh, met up with a few of them and he said, oh, you probably may have heard the story, but he, I'll, I'll lend you some gi. Let's go down the road and you're coming with me to BJJ tonight. And, you know, someone half your size taps you out, uh, <laughs> which is probably a harder way to learn that rule. Um, another cool. hard way to learn that is when you injure yourself. And I can tell you uh, when I was competing at a high level, every single one of my friends had injuries and I never had one. And mm. really that just goes to show, I know that's just my experience, but I've seen that kind of play out so many times. The interesting thing I wanted to touch on about the Band-Aid effect, I often say to people, having the ability to modulate pain is fantastic, right? If someone's coming to you and you can create motion where something is not moving and they're going to feel a little bit better and you can help modulate that pain for in the interim, that means that they're going to grab less anti-inflammatories or less Panadol or Tylenol, as you call it in America. Mm -hmm. That is a good thing. But like you said, how do we carry on that progression? And we've had a few strength coaches on this podcast before and we've even talked about the referral network between doctors and even strength coaches because to, being able to refer to someone that understands biomechanic uh, maybe outside of a clinical setting can be absolutely necessary and i know steven um, spoke on that during that podcast the thing is is like you're saying there are so many chiropractors out there that are not adding in the most important part, which is like, hey, how do we outwork this biomechanical issue? Which is very interesting, right? Because there is quite a bit of literature, obviously, on spinal manipulation and the modulation of pain, short-term increase in proprioception, range of motion, and even maximal voluntary contraction output, force output, which can have real cool implications for certain demographics of the population that may have injuries, may struggle with gait, etc. But mm. it's all very short-term. So it's using that in the interim and then it's being able to outwork a program to have context you need specificity and to have a specific diagnosis you need specificity of assessment so being able to do that biomechanically is the piece that's left out in our education when i was at Cairo school i did one one biomechanics paper um oh. it was fantastic because they introduced me to Pun punjabi and white which is a really um, cornerstone biomechanical oh. ideology but and book but it's, uh, it's very worrying that that seems mm. to be um, the reoccurring thing. And if you don't have an undergrad in exoscience or a master's in exoscience like um, Dr. Stephen, you are definitely missing that piece. And so the mm. importance of communication to your patient and then that, and also having a referral network, because obviously you've created this amazing system between <laughs> CrossFit box and, you know, as a neurosurgeon, the place that we were working, that relationship, you've got the synergy, which is fantastic. But in other parts of the world, America, Stephen's having the same problem. I'm having the same problem here in New Zealand. We need to build a greater network so that we can cross refer. And this is leading me to your college of clinicians. If you want to talk on yeah. that briefly. Well, that's, that's right. I mean, um, just touching on the CrossFit, the clinical model that we we practice by and every disease needs a clinical model right what you what was happening is that patients would be coming in with pain and disability 
they would be reacquiring movement proficiency. That would then remove their pain and disability, so they'd be just healthy people. Mm. But then it was like, where do I go from here? And then the next phase of that model is increasing capacity and um, athleticism. And that's where the CrossFit came in because the CrossFit um, foundations or methodology is a functional movement uh, at high intensity uh, or relative high intensity. And so you would see these patients move along the spectrum, disabled, painful patient, healthy, and that's then cool. athlete. That's very cool. Okay. And so that's the kind of athleticism that you, that happens organically when you restore people's biomechanics. It's 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 a physiological certainty. You know, just like when the Titanic was going to sink, it was it got that iceberg in the hull. It was a it was a certainty that that boat was going to sink. Mm-hmm. And and the same with biomechanics. If I have a pay, if I get them early enough when the body can still do the repair mechanisms. Clearly, if it's a write-off, you're not going to repair the car, right? But if you get a patient early enough, you know, when they're in the early phases of their journey of back pain, they don't need any structural surgical intervention. You fix their biomechanics, their pain disappears. Where do I go from here, doc? Continue with your functional movement, Add some load, add some speed, add some duration, add some variety of different functional movements. Now you're a bloody crossfitter, right? And and now you're you're an athlete. And and the days, and I've got so many patients that that crossfit with me. And I pinch myself every now and then when I think back to them, you know, three or four years ago when they had difficulty getting out of bed. Mm, wow. And now they are doing bloody toes to bar deadlifts uh assault bike rowing all in the one 15 to 20 minute workout and at the end of that workout amazing. laying on the floor in a pool of sweat you know it, it, it is amazing it is profound and when it started happening i was just like wow but now it's just so common now it's just so common to see people move down this um move down this this uh this spectrum of progression that it, it doesn't surprise me anymore. And it just proves that the clinical model is watertight. The clinical model of movement dysfunction mm. is absolutely watertight. And it can't, and I've been, I've had, I'm open to having discussions with anyone and everyone about the clinical model because no one can poke a hole in it. And when you have a clinical model that is so watertight, um, that's kind of what drives the passion because we've got this you steve other people within our network we we know that we've got this genie in the bottle solution Mm. for one of the world's most disabling conditions and um you know that's why we're sitting here talking about it now and that's why we're i'm working hard with uh dr andrew Locke, who's equally on the same page and has equal amount of experience that the model works to develop this college of functional movement clinicians I just want to like dive in a little bit with the CrossFit thing Mm. because obviously we're very much on the same page about technique being important. And I did a post the other day about using technique as a gatekeeper or as a prerequisite to not only load, but intensities. I remember, I think you commented and we talked briefly about it. My experience with CrossFit is uh, I used to do some programming at the local box, which was in the business at the time. For the strength elements of CrossFit? Yeah. And I used to train there as well. I had a few different friends that have run CrossFit gyms over the years. And the one thing we would disagree on, this is why I'm so interested to hear your thoughts, is the technical aspect, because like I said before, CrossFit at its bones, right? If we go back 10 years ago where everyone was fangirling over Rich Froning, (laughs) <laughs> um, I still do, I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Matt Fraser, Matt Fraser now, I think. <laughs> but the yeah. and it's bone, right? It's functional movements for time, right? Or for high intensity. And so how do you approach it at your CrossFit box for your CrossFit athletes or for the people that have a high capacity? How do you enable that technique is maintained when you're pushing complex movement, biomechanical mm-hmm. positions under load mm-hmm. and you're pushing them for time and uh, for high reps? Because obviously if we want to push change or if we want tissue adaptation, we can do it with load, you know, but we can also mm-hmm. do it with high reps and and we can gas oh, multiple right. energy but systems intensity, in the body yeah intensity. intensity intensity is the driver of neurohormonal stimulation 
Okay, so if you if you're if you're sitting there reading a magazine on an elliptical trainer, mm. and you can you can sit on that elliptical trainer in a gym, as I as I have seen mm. many times when I go down to the hotel gym level, there's a, clearly a very different level of intensity. Mm. And if I got a needle out and took drew some blood and and measured my levels of growth hormone, um, insulin, dopamine, serotonin, brain derived neurotrophic factor. Mm. Um, all of these are hormones that create physiological changes. I, mine would be sky high compared to the person oh, yeah. doing low intensity training on the elliptical. And so if you're trying to create a physiological change in your body, you kind of need a little bit of intensity. Okay. Um, and so I, I, an intensity can come from one 400 kilogram deadlift. That's bloody intense. So you would have got that same physiological stimulus, or you can do a 15 minute uh, yeah. high intensity function workout and still yeah. get the same intensity. Mm. So intensity comes in many forms. Yeah. Um, but when you, when you've experienced intensity, you know it, right? And that's one of the, the benchmarks of the methodology of CrossFit. And that's why they say it's constantly varied, uh, function movement at relative high intensity. Relative high intensity for for you is different for me, different for my my mum. I won't go up to that. Like when I was competing, I was only ever maxing out on the platform, and I was only mm. ever lifting the heaviest I'd ever lifted on the platform. And um, when I did when I did four hundred or whatever, it was you know very precise. Yeah. So when you have people in your gym, would you get someone to work up to uh, the amount of intensity they can while maintaining technique? It's a it's a hierarchy. So yep. technique is the the foundation stone that's the that's the that's the concrete slab of building your fitness or mm. building your health if you if you have not got the foundation stone of movement proficiency you're on a broomstick yeah exactly. you're on a broomstick and, yeah. okay so you can't you can't hold a barbell or put any plates on until you can express and show the coaches that you understand the biomechanics of pulling that barbell off the ground once you understand that, once you understand that movement motor pattern, yeah. now I can slowly start adding weights. Okay. And as long yeah, as I capacity. stay within my boundary of capacity, mm. as long as I constantly hover underneath my bound, say that's my, that's, that's my level of capacity and I'm doing, you know, five by five, just below my capacity. What's happening over time is my boundary of capacity is getting higher. Mm. So now my five by five is an extra five to 10 kilos. And then six months later, my boundary of capacity, I'm still, I'm still under the boundary of capacity. My loads are going up. So, you know, my best deadlift is 201 kilograms. It's taken me, taken me 10 years to work up to 201 kilograms. Yeah, but, but it's impressive. You know, well, for, for a nearly 50 year old office worker. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, it's very impressive. Uh, you know, that, it just goes back to showing that the, the clinical model of movement proficiency as the the cornerstone of building musculoskeletal health I love that. Uh, is is non conjectural. Yeah, is non conjectural. Um, so good. And, and your your point about CrossFit is that I'm not. I I am the first person to say there are many CrossFit um, uh, affiliates that may not prioritize the movement proficiency because it's almost a joke among amongst us therapists um and as like, you said oh, the ego yeah the, the crossfitters ego, are there's... paying for our um, student loans <laughs> and stuff like that <laughs> well yeah. yeah well that can be true that doesn't take away from what methodology is preaching that mm. just means that that affiliate is not really focused on what builds athleticism mm. and musculoskeletal health and our and i've talked to crossfit inc about this so i think that um there should be a, a CrossFit um, seminar on clinical CrossFit, and you can you can then potentially assign that clinical um, badge to certain boxes around the world. And there's about fifteen thousand CrossFit boxes around the world that have a that have that priority focus on movement proficiency. Mm. Um, I like that. Uh, but yeah, our box, you know, our box is called CrossFit Neuro, and that is that is the absolute fundamental um, uh, requirement of of any member is that they understand movement proficiency and the biomechanics. And and our coaches will just um, they'll just strip the weight off the patient if they're not moving well. It's uh, so good to hear that. But I was going to ask if your coaches are actually there regressing people because I did CrossFit for a little bit. Not long enough to say I was a CrossFitter. 
But right. when I did CrossFit for the little bit of time that I did, I noticed that it was always push elevating the person to the next level. <clears throat> and this, even if it meant failure of form, even if it meant vomiting yesterday's food out, it was yeah. always another step forward instead of, hey, maybe you should hold back just a little bit. Maybe yeah. we should scale you down just a little bit. Yeah. I don't know who came up with that term regression to progression. Um, you've got to you've got to have regressions um, yeah. that build that motor pattern, and then you progress. I mean, it's it's, it's pretty logical. Maybe it's just it's the it's alpha, like the you know, you get a bunch of guys together with their tops off training, and things just kind of like get out of hand, and then because right. the nature of it is to do things to time. Immediately, you are encouraged to get uh -huh. get as many uh -huh. reps in by the end of this uh -huh. minute, or you know, like with uh -huh. what Murph or yeah. Grace or whatever. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's really refreshing to hear your approach yeah. to it because I agree what you're saying is. CrossFit, and as it should be, is fantastic. I mean, you really oh, yeah. can't beat the, it. The, the fundamental principles is is insane. That's yeah. why they claim the fittest on earth, right? That's why the, that's why they, they they build Matt Fraser. Yeah, is um, that, yeah. If you, yeah. Listen to what, if, you, if you listen to what Matt Fraser said, he said that he said that his last rep looks exactly like his first rep. Yeah, that's that is okay. it, and that that mindset and ideology of how you train is really what should be filtering down but what i find is that what gets filtered down to the boxes is just that the competitive nature outweighs the technical prowess or the technical ability it's really refreshing to hear what you're saying and even for our listeners to hear because i think some therapists might wince a little bit when they hear the word crossfit still I, that's definitely like that in new zealand the culture here so it's mm. really awesome to hear that your ideology around that is hey technique is the foundation and movement proficiency is absolutely important um, and then you can build your intensity or you can build the load or you can push yourself and you don't get to progress until you, you know, have shown adequate level of technique. The textbooks, the current musculoskeletal textbooks and specifically uh, spine, spinal disease textbooks, there's not a single chapter that actually defines proficient uh, spinopelvic movement. Okay, so like the, the teachers and the, um, the, the current day clinicians they can't actually say to their patients, "These, are, this is how you move." Um, so issue. I think I think the college that we're developing, the College of Functional Movement Clinicians, is going to be comprised predominantly of people with calluses on their hands. Yeah. Okay, it's going to be people who 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 I've been grinding mine off. <laughs> yeah, you know um, exactly, and and this is a good thing. Because that's that's the requirement for you to be a member of our college, mm. um, and uh, and if you, I don't care what your background, if you know how to lift, um, if you know how to swing a kettlebell, if you know how to do a squat, mm. um, you have a lot to offer the musculoskeletal rehabilitation industry more than someone who's been to university for five years and got a you know, uh, a, a PhD or a member of some institute of musculoskeletal health, but hasn't got no root muscles, has completely decrepit hamstrings, because that person who's got all the letters cannot teach someone to move well. Mm. And they probably won't ever believe it. They will never become passionate about it. Yeah. Whereas, whereas the people that we communicate with, uh, if, they've got a, if they've got that knowledge and that skill set, it doesn't take much for us to then just um, mentor them a little bit on the clinical aspects of uh, musculoskeletal disease, and they will make a huge impact. And and that's what I'm. That's what I'm. Almost every post I'm hashtagging College of Functional Movement Clinicians because yes. I want all of our subscribers and and people that care to listen to what we've got to say to realise that um, that they have a skill set that is invaluable to the epidemic of back pain. It's yeah. invaluable. And we need to collaborate. We need to collaborate. We need to make the College of Functional Movement Clinicians a very powerful organization through that very collaboration. Okay. Just me and Andrew Locke doing it is not going to do anything. But if 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 you, me, Stephen, everyone, all the people who understand movement around the world collaborate and we we create this college. And we wear that sticker. We put that sticker on our on our studios as a badge of honor. We understand movement. 
organically it's going to be profoundly successful because the community will talk about the results okay yeah. and at the end of the day results speak way more than how many degrees you've got yeah. okay and and the community will talk from grassroots level they'll talk amongst themselves and say, hey you need to go and see this guy who's a who's a, a, a movement clinician i know you've been seeing the physio who manages the wallabies or whatever but um but you need to see a movement clinician and and they'll look up the website where's where's the nearest movement clinician to me and the website will have that and um uh mm -hmm. they will seek you out so have you found many other medical doctors with this similar mindset i know you're only the second one that i found the other one i found is chris rayner out of canada i'm not sure if you're familiar with him well, i should touch base with him i'm going to write his name down Chris. Oh, I can. Yeah. Let me just show my screen and I can. R A Y N O R. Uh, hold on one moment. Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's R A Y N O R. Is he in Canada? Is he? Yes, sir. Do you see that on your screen now? Yeah. He's, he's fantastic, this guy. Wonderful. Yeah. Orthopedic surgeon. Wonderful. Stable knees. Stable knee. So he's a knee surgeon, is he? He's so, big I'll, on the I'll knees, but he's... he's big on the knees. Yeah, I've heard him. <laughs> he's done some really good um, collabs. I've heard he's, he's got yeah, cool. a podcast. Yeah. So the, I mean, to answer your question, there's not there's not too many. Um, yeah. There's not too many clinicians. They're too busy, right. uh, you know, treating the symptoms. I mean, we did a, a collab recently, uh, which was fantastic. And I felt like we got to kind of push a little bit of your ideas out there into onto social media. And we had like a lot of people sharing and um, learning about the four pillars of health. But one yeah. thing I was listening to one of your lectures in preparation for that collab, because um, I was really trying to digest your content and your um, thought process around everything so that I could represent it best I could on uh, that infographic we did yeah thank and, you for that. That's, that was wonderful yeah and one thing that i really liked and we ended up putting on the infographic was how you differentiate between exercise and functional movement under load could you mm -hmm. talk about that a little more functional movement has its own own sort of characteristics and definitions um and movement proficiency has its own has its own definitions that i that i use um so you you can do a functional movement poorly mm. okay so it doesn't mean that so say a, say a front squat okay it, or a back squat that's a functional movement because it meets the criteria of you know multi-joint uh movement core to extremity wide range of motion um inherently powerful the the um the most efficient way to move large loads long distances quickly mm. okay um, they're also natural movements. Okay. A baby will do a beautiful squat. They're, they're natural. They're, they're hardwired into our DNA. Yep. So those are the characteristics that kind of drive the, the define a functional movement. So you can list them out and we just listed out a few. I'm sure there's a couple that I left out. Um, so that's one element. Okay. So the second element is what defines movement proficiency for the lumbar spell, pelvic spine and i yeah. i've just i've synthesized that down i don't know if you've seen any of my posts that try to synthesize that down on social media but um it really boils down to these rules right um hip centric rotation neutral spine maintenance and awareness posterior kinetic chain powered movement mm. unloaded knee positions and proficiency limited range of motion okay so there's five those are my five rules that define movement proficiency for the lumbar pelvic spine. And then, and there's, and you can elaborate on why they are, and we can talk about that later in a second. But um, when I do a functional movement, I want to incorporate those movement proficiency rules whilst doing my functional movement. And over time, if I have that as my default movement pattern, my musculoskeletal tissues, my joints, my cartilages, my joint capsules, my muscles, my tendons, my ligaments all become healthier. Mm. And so that, that, is the, that is the pillar of health in, regarding, in regards to musculoskeletal health is quality movement. 
Um, and movement proficiency and functional movement defines quality mo- the quality movement pillar. If I don't do functional movements, just say, just say for instance, I just do bicep curls. Nothing wrong with doing bicep curls, right? If you if you want to get super strong muscles, it's super strong biceps, right? But <laughs> that by definition wouldn't meet the criteria of being a functional movement. Yeah, single yeah. joint. And so, so to build musculoskeletal health, where you're incorporating the whole body into the tasks, will build much greater musculoskeletal health globally. When There's more bang for your buck, right? Yeah, when you do things in life, you're kind of doing functional movements. When I empty the dishwasher, when I take the, when I pick the laundry basket up, when I'm opening up a filing cabinet, you know, just think about everything you do in daily. Like when I get out of this chair, that's a multi-joint functional movement. Mm. Okay, so why not do it biomechanically proficiently as well to then create that musculoskeletal health pillar? Does that make sense? It It absolutely makes sense. Like you were saying, right, at the start of the podcast, and you said it before as well, this stuff seems like common sense. So logical. (laughs) Yet we have people on social media ripping into us from time to time, especially some of the more uh, popular channels, such as Dr. Aaron Mm. from Squat U who are preaching these good movement patterns and, and technique uh, as a you know, very important aspect of exercise. I think the critics are scared because they don't understand it. Like how would you respond to those parts of the medical community and manual medicine community that so strongly claim that technique is not really that important because we can adapt yeah. to anything over time if we needed to? You can say, well, the, these are the, the, the biomechanical and scientific principles behind why you're wrong and why I'm right. Mm. Or you can turn around and say, how bad is chronic musculoskeletal disease in, in our society now? Okay. Bad. And then we, we, we know the answer to that. It's mm. the, one of the leading causes of disability on the planet. It's ubiquitous. Uh, it's it's a growing epidemic. Right? So you guys have been preaching that biomechanics is not important, that technique is not important, that intralumbar flexion is okay for a long time. Okay. Yeah. And when I go out into the shopping center and I see people moving, I am not seeing them moving well. Not at all. So clearly society is not moving well mm. and we have this epidemic. So you want to just keep that you want to just keep that paradigm that failing paradigm going and just seeing a growing epidemic so mm. that's one way to say well look at the numbers mate it's terrible they would say that uh through the 90s like mcgill's ideologies became very popular and people have been scared into moving and told to stay rigid and rather than helping people create confidence through their kinesio awareness and movement they're being restricted and told to stay stiff. Obviously, they take our position and our straw man and turn it into something that they can easily break down. But they often talk about that. I sent you a video even prior to this podcast where um, a very popular person in the industry that's known for his ideologies around low back, non-specific low back pain, was talking about lifting heavy weight with a loose belly, with a loose back not worrying about being stiff, not worrying about creating any abdominal pressure. There's literally what you can hear. He's on YouTube saying this. He's on multiple studies trying to prove time and time and time again that McGill's wrong, really at the bottom of it. And you know, at the at the bottom of it, he's just he's trying to prove that it's been negative, that ideology. So I suppose like many of them would argue that it hasn't all been uh, but, one but way. Most of the most of the community do have no attention to the to proficient moving so like people are already doing that you could you could you could almost say that you could almost say that that people who are are telling people to not worry about having a rounded back when they lift for example Mm. that's that's what people do now like so (laughs) you've got what you want exactly right (laughs) okay so so you could say yes your message has got out there the community does move terribly and look at the result yeah okay? yeah so it's it's they're kind of like they're shooting themselves in the feet when they say this um because look look at just next time you go out just look at how someone 
get something off the bottom shelf of a in a shopping well a people shopping have mall. no pelvic control like i mean everything yeah. is people just push everything into the lower back and you just see people yep. people don't even know how to use their hips or how to hinge yep. um yep. you know there's just so many like biomechanical issues and you can you can even just see it if you watch someone walk and it's yep. it's a it's really sad that there are keys and strategies to help these people but the fact is that the information is not getting to the user and yeah. that dysfunction between the information and them is i suppose what we're all trying to clear up it's very difficult it, it, it's kind of these guys are so they're so fixated on um intra lumbar flexion being okay it, it kind of it it reflects that they do not understand stability as well because mm. one of the other arguments that they put forward is oh look at Look at this person, this power lifter who's, who's about to break the world record or they'll show someone lifting some enormous weight with a rounded back. Yeah. Okay. Because that person is at threshold. That, that person is at threshold, okay? Um, and what, that, what they don't understand is the elements that create stability, remember? And there's not just – stability comes from three main things. Coordination, the active structures, so how strong your muscles are, and the passive structures, what the ligaments and tendons and joint capsules are like, right? Mm. So if you are at threshold and you've got a massive capacity in terms of your passive and active structures, so your muscles and ligaments and tendons, so just say they are super high capacity and you're at threshold and you slightly lose coordination and start to become a little bit rounded in your lumbar spine, mm you're still stable because you've got the very high level of passive factors, very high level of active factors. And because you're at threshold, your, your, your proficiency and coordination for the move may drop off a little bit. Right. Mm, yeah. But the only way you maintain a super high level of active and passive structures was because your default movement was primarily excellent movement proficiency. Yeah. Excellent movement proficiency at sub-threshold levels develops good passive structures, develops good active structures, and now I'm a super stable person. I have earned the privilege to sometimes drop out of perfect positions and not end up in a hospital. Me and Dr. Locke were literally just talking about it. I wrote this down. I'll, I'll read it out real quick, but me and Dr. Locke came oh, up oh. with this because we, we, we were trying to find a way to like articulate what we're trying to say. And so we came up with this. We said, flexion and load can cause injury, right? So that's referring to the mechanism that McGill's proven. We must respect the literature that has demonstrated the mechanism. However, this does not make flexion under load inherently, which is an inseparable element, dangerous. It requires context. We follow the principles of biomechanics, capacity versus load and prioritize technical ability and neuromuscular stability as a prerequisite to safer, more efficient movement under load, including flexion. Rather than demonizing or fixating on a single structural position, we look to integrate the coordination of all systems synergistically, which are active, passive, and proprioceptive. We kind of just came up with that because we're getting so sick of people saying that we're saying that flexion is inherently dangerous and bad when it, it really does come down to context and like i said before context requires specificity and specificity requires specificity of assessment um i love how you were breaking it down into those into the subsystems yeah. and it's absolutely right And when we see mcgill's 2000 study with the fluoroscopy the it's radiographer asked yeah. him to you know shift and it was uh -huh. boom that was enough to alter the neuromuscular coordination and he buckled and and there was a buckling of the segment he's lost stability okay one of the elements of his movement task in terms of passive active and neural control failed so he became unstable okay? everything that you read out there is correct and 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 very precise but it can be even synthesized, I think it can be synthesized down even more simply and punchier that the holy grail is stability. If I round my spine yeah. and I'm stable, hallelujah, continue rounding, right? Continue yeah. rounding all you like. If I round my spine and I'm unstable, you're screwed. You're absolutely screwed. But I will preach it to the cows come home that if I maintain neutral spine, hip-centric rotation, posterior kinetic chain-powered movement, I will have a far greater likelihood of remaining stable mm. than if I have intralumbar flexion.
Yeah. Which is why I agree. you can pull 200 kilogram deadlift with that biomechanical principle and a Jefferson curl, maybe 30 or 40 kilograms. Mm. Okay. Let me see someone talk about a Jefferson curl at their, at their maximum weight. No freaking chance. <laughs> they, will be, they will be in hospital because it's inherently a less stable biomechanical principle. You're breaking one of the principles of which you just said. Yeah, right. If you were to do exactly. that. Do it with an empty barbell for sure, because you're still stable. Mm, you've yeah. still got adequate neural control. You've still got adequate muscle tension. You've got adequate um, uh, passive structures. So yes, an empty barbell Jefferson curl is okay, even though my coordination element is suboptimal. Mm. But the moment you start loading that barbell and try to do a Jefferson curl, you're going you're gonna to become unstable. The passive structures will fail. You'll get a disc prolapse. It, it just comes down to stability being the holy grail. Mm. And if I want to build stability, my default movement pattern, yeah. my default has to be movement proficiency. Those yeah. rules that we talked about. Then I'll have a high level of capacity, a high level of stability. You know, if I slip over on a banana peel, I'll fall but I'll be stable. Mm. Whereas someone who moves poorly, right? Someone who moves poorly all the time, they bend over to pick up their lunchbox one day at the, at the work site, even though they're a laborer and they just, their back just suddenly gives way because their stability and their capacity has declined over time from not having a default motor pattern that is proficient. And it's interesting because as a strength athlete, like I live in the sagittal plane and uh, Andrew was having me on saying, oh, I, I want you to try to do some side planks. And I said, oh, yeah, I do side planks. <laughs> like I do McGill stuff. I've done that for a long time. You know, when I was when, when I warm up, I, I make sure I do that. And he's like, no, no, no. I want you to do some ab like once you're in your side plank position, I want you to do some abduction, some hip abduction on top of that. He's like, good luck, you know? And he knew very well what was going to happen. And it happened. I got pulled, I put my leg up and I crumbled like a house of cards, even though I can squat 400 kgs. So it's like, I haven't, I haven't spent time in that position when I should. And that's yeah. likely a weakness that I have based on the limitations of my training. <laughs> but I just think it's funny because we were also discussing that, um, with uh, Dr. Stephen, because he's been seeing a lot of QL strains lately and obviously training your QL is really important if you, uh, if your sport requires any frontal plane movement. Um, and that's something that McGill's spoken about too. When we're retraining movement proficiency, it can't be done in one session. And our program, our NeuroHab program is an eight week program. And um, patients attend that program two times a week for eight weeks. So that's 16 hours of training. And they probably do a hip hinge with a broomstick on their back, you know, 10,000 times during that 16 hours. That works. And, 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 and we all know that, you know, that 10,000 10, repetition or 10,000 rule. Um, if you were going to learn how to hit a golf ball with a golf coach, um, you're going to stand there in the, in the driving range and the golf coach is going to stand opposite you and watch you and show you and correct you and cue you and, and adjust the position of your elbow, your grip, your stance, your, your body position. And you're going to just swing golf balls, swing at golf balls. And when you go to a golf range, how many balls are in a bucket? Do they oh. give you five? Do they give you 10? No, <laughs> you buy them in buckets of yeah, 80 like or a hundred. And, and then you, and then you go back uh, the next weekend and the next weekend and the next yeah. weekend. And, and that's why the actual program, our program is called NeuroHab. It's rehabilitation of the nervous system motor patterns. We steered away from it being a muscular rehabilitation because that's kind of a dime a dozen, right? There's lots of exercise physiologists and people making you fitter and stronger. But mm. in terms of retraining motor patterns, that hence the term neurohab, um, because that's what we're focusing on. And and I will see a patient do a one hour class of neurohab. It might be their second week or their third week. And in the corner of our, our center, we've got a little drinking fountain. Okay. And they they just done an hour of neurohab and then they walk over and get a drink and they bend over with intralumbar flexion. Okay, so I immediately know, and the coaches are watching, they know that that person has not established default motor patterns for movement proficiency. Okay, 
But at the end of eight weeks, when it's been hammered home and they've practiced it with all sorts of different stimuli, all sorts of different um, uh, durations, all sorts of different speeds, all sorts of different ranges of motion with carrying or, or not carrying implements, the motor pattern starts to entrench, okay? So when at the end of the program, when the patients go to pick up their car keys or their handbag or their, you know, their towel, um, the motor pattern is automatic and they do it beautifully. Now we've fixed the problem, but it doesn't happen yeah. overnight. And that's why you cannot retrain a motor pattern in a short time frame. That's why we've, we've, ta- we've, we've tested it over the years yeah. and eight weeks, two times a week seems to be that sweet spot. Okay. And it's no different. If I said to you, Brogan, I want you to juggle three ping pong balls and I want you to do it for at least a minute or 30 seconds. If I said to you, I'm going to, I'm going to check you out next week and we're going to do a podcast and you're going to juggle three ping pong balls for 30 seconds. (laughs) Guess what? Guess how long it'll take you. It'll take you about eight. I'll tell you something interesting. I, I managed to, uh, I did, I recently took this challenge actually yeah. um, for my son. He, he, he said, yeah. he goes, dad, I want you to, to juggle. I said, well, if you want me to juggle, oh, I'll wow. juggle. So you've already practiced. And um, so it went one night and one night with one hour's training, I got to three, but I could only do it like, you know, maybe two cycles. So like five, yeah. like like three seconds or four seconds, but it was enough for it to look like juggling. And he was yeah. like, you're amazing. And then I gave up. <laughs> yeah, but I want you to do it for thirty. Seconds. I want you to do it for thirty seconds, like you could be that takes busking time. on a busking on a street corner, right? I want you to do it for thirty seconds, where someone's going to give you Man, a dollar. Talking about right. technical prowess or technical ability is it's really a- like it's it's so fundamental because um, myself and Stephen play instruments and yes, there you go. Yeah, i did a lot of music go. early on straight out of yes, I, straight out of school i did a lot of music i at some points i was doing six six hours a day practicing and it's i insane, realized like, that yeah yeah just yeah and the decay of, of technical ability was so rapid it's so interesting yeah. how we can never really get to that point where we think we're too good for technique because yeah. there yeah, are yeah. world champion you know weightlifters world champion powerlifters yes. you know myself included when i go into the gym i'm never above technique because i know that that real upper level of technical prowess that does actually decay quite like the, the stimulus recovery and adaptation curve is actually kind of oh, rapid yeah. and so oh, it's yeah. a good it's, it's really good to like keep yourself grounded on that because um yeah. sometimes yeah. you go in and you think oh i've i've done my ten thousand hours but um oftentimes you you have to continually sharpen that spear otherwise you find yes. yourself um you know, just, just yes. a little bit of the icing off the top. You lose a little bit of that, you know. Yes. So <laughs> it's all about motor patterns and making them default. Um, and it and it takes a long time. And and the other thing in terms of your proprioception um, term there, we know that people who have bad, bad, unhealthy backs, they lose their multifidus muscle. Stephen, mm. are, you, are you familiar Sorry. with the multifidus muscle? Yeah, that's a really important intersegmental stabilizer for the spine. Actually, and like coordinates movement throughout other muscles. Very I densely can't believe proprioception. Yeah, that's actually super yep, dense yep. Pro- perceptive sensory input, but it's also it helps coordinate movement of the actual yes. back. Yeah, you can feel yourself hitting that nice stable neutral position, and that's the that's the multifidus kind of telling you that, right? And we do sometimes get some patients who who you know we're just hammering home neutral spine, hip hinge bending. But if I MRI scan them and their multifidus is gone, it's you know, fatty atrophy. Yeah, infiltrate. it's very hard for them to be aware that they're even in the neutral position. Mm. Um, and so that can become a real challenge. And, and the reason why the multifidus is atrophied, because they haven't been moving well for years. The coordination okay. has been lost, right? Oh, yeah. Of course, if you're not moving well and activating the multifidus during your, your bending yeah. positions. Mm. Of course, the multifidus is going to atrophy and the Makes big sense. muscles, you know, the, the, the bigger erector spinae muscles, they will take over the movement. And so that synergistic dominance just means the big yeah. muscles get bigger and the very small control muscles get smaller. Mm. And now you're stuffed. Now you're really in trouble. And yep. so there is, there is a, a recent development and technological device called the Reactivate. Yes, uh, I've seen you post about that. Yep. Functional. It's the first functional uh, uh, neurostimulating device 
uh, for back pain in the world. And it's oh. absolutely very exciting because the success rates of that system, that neurostimulation of multifidus, further highlights how correct we are. Yeah. Okay. It further highlights how correct we are in terms of intersegmental stability and, mm. and functional uh, the functional disease of back pain. Because when mm. we eliminate the functional disease by restoring multifidus health, we regain movement proficiency. And so that's why the results of Reactivate are so profoundly effective as compared to other types of you know, neurostimulated devices such wow. as dorsal column stimulators and yeah. dorsal root ganglion stimulators. And um, and even spinal fusion and disc replacements, you know, they they have a fifty percent success rate because when you do yeah. a spinal fusion and disc replacement, you have not actually made that patient more skillful at all. You've just put some metal and titanium in them. Mm. Putting some metal and titanium in them does not make them better at moving. Right. Okay, so then they develop the adjacent segment disease or they develop <laughs> sacroiliac joint pain. Yeah, and that's something Dr. Locke actually, me and him were talking about uh, with lumbar segmental fusion, the changes that exhibit above and below. They call that adjacent segment disease. Really it's, a, it's a misunderstanding. It's a misconception, right? It does happen, but mm. it's, not, it's not because the person's had the spinal fusion. It's because the patient hasn't been taught after the spinal fusion to maintain neutral wow. spine positions as default. Yeah. Does that make sense? It totally makes sense. You know, like if I if I put Absolutely. a titanium if I put a titanium strut across your L four five or your L five S one, and you continue to have intra lumbar flexion, mm. where does the biomechanical stress zone in on? Yeah, the adjacent yeah. segment. Yeah, it just goes upstream or downstream depending on what's, what's used. Yeah. So I won't do a spinal fusion in someone if they if they refuse to do functional movement therapy after or before their surgery that is such a sad reflection of the the surgical industry and and the rehabilitation industry to not tell that person hey you've you've had a spinal fusion now your adjacent segment is even more susceptible to biomechanical stress if you don't fix up your movement proficiency it's we're going to cut into you and fix it up but there's no follow-up and that's why what you're talking about is so profound and needed worldwide it should be in every textbook, I think, uh, Bragan. And um, we're working on a textbook uh, called Movement Theory. Okay, so all of the, a lot of the things that we've talked about today, mm. um, it's going to piggyback on on the stuff that McGill's written. You know, but it all needs to be brought into one textbook, and it really should be called Movement Theory because that textbook still does not exist. Yeah. Um, I've I've read the uh, the Gray Cook uh, book about uh, the FMS screening and stuff like that. Yep. And I think his book is called Movement. Yeah. But it's it's kind of um it's kind of still I feel as though it's still lacking in terms of pulling it all together yep. to create this uh, this uh, this unifying theory of yep. musculoskeletal pain in particular low back pain. It's kind of like I think I look at Gray Cook's book like it's it's teaching you the alphabet but it Learning the alphabet doesn't mean you can write beautiful poetry. Yep. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, yep. makes sense. Um, and, and really what's important is being able to take those pieces of the alphabet and put them together and, and be very skillful with, uh, with applying those individual puzzle pieces into the global problem. Mm. Uh, and that's where this, we're still lacking in that textbook. And um, when I get time... <laughs> Uh, we're just adding a <laughs> paragraph, enough. adding a chapter at a time. Yeah. And and the College of Functional Movement Clinicians, you know, we're all going to collaborate and we're all going to give our own experiences um, and it's going to sort of fast track. It's almost going to be a collaborative effort to build, to write that book. Yeah, um, no, so it's, I mean, whatever me and Stephen can do, by all means, let us know. This will be the first of its kind in terms of the college. Uh, and I think we should really focus on just having one college. Mm. Um, uh, at least you can have, you get, if you have your own, say your New Zealand organization, that's great, but make sure that all of those New Zealand organizations are also part of the, the one college as well, because yeah. you kind of need the numbers to have influence. Okay. Yeah. If we go to the Australian quality care standards committee, um, as the college, 
with 10,000 members from around the world, some of them being Brogan, Stephen, um, uh, McGill, uh, Aaron from Scott University, Andrew Locke, and, and the other, you know, this guy, Chris Rayner, right? And, and, and we go there with those ambassadors to a government organisation say, hey, your, your standards, your quality care standards do not have one sentence dedicated to biomechanical movement proficiency. Do you realise that back pain is the leading cause of disability in the country and the leading cause of economic burden in the country? Do you think that we could improve that guideline a little bit so that GPs mm. and, and physios and, and exercise physiologists can start to think about movement and have, a, a, have accessibility to an organisation that can teach them about movement? Yeah. Do you think that would be... And if you've got 10,000 people all saying the same thing, they will actually start to listen. And then those haters on your socials who, who continue to criticise you, they're going to be up against it. They're going to be up against continuing to criticise because the college has is, is become the, the, uh, the default referral base. Okay? And if you're not wearing that badge of honour, College of Functional Movement Clinicians, uh, on, your, on your T-shirt or plastered up on your waiting room wall, people are just going to go somewhere else. Mm. Okay. If you don't have that, that's what I, that's what my, my vision is that, that in terms of musculoskeletal health, people will seek out a movement clinician first and foremost. Yeah. And yep. GPs will go, Oh, you got back pain. Have you? Uh, I'll just find the nearest functional movement clinician to you. And uh, they can just jump on the website. Oh, Brogan's Brogan's in the next neighboring suburb to you. Go and see Brogan mm. because he's a, he's a member of the college of functional movement clinicians. Steven's a member of the college of functional movement clinicians. Go and see that chiropractor because he understands movement. That's how we can grow it. And I think it's possible if it is possible to grow it because it, it fundamentally Absolutely. is so um so sound in its uh, ration you know in its in its scientific basis there's actually um a similar thing eh, Stephen? with i mean it's a facebook group but there's like ten thousand people that forward thinking chiropractic alliance and it's a group yeah. of um pretty much evidence-based chiros that just get together and share and help each other and they do events and stuff. I mean, um, Stephen's involved with it, but even I that's been so helpful because when I was going through chiro school, that was like the only thing keeping me sane. Just, just, <laughs> knowing, that there, just knowing that there are other people out there. And that's what I, you know, I only just opened that, um, that Neurohab uh, movement therapy Instagram page. I don't normally use Instagram for anything, but um, just seeing that, there's a there's a thousand people that um acknowledge that this makes sense that's kind of what keeps you keeps you sane mm. um and and i know that there's people out there looking looking for something that unifies our our way of thinking absolutely because i'm happy to wrap up we've been able to cover we could so go much. we could go all night you know, i feel like we could <laughs> <laughs> i feel like we could literally go for hours about. i think we have turned a lot of stones um you know we've talked about lots today hopefully uh hopefully it'll wake a few people up and get people interested if you're hearing this and and you want to learn more about the college um the, the in terms of getting in contact with myself or, or andrew Locke. Um, the easiest way to get in touch with us is through our email, which is info um, at FMTC, as that stands for Functional Movement Training Center, uh, .com .au, info at fmtc.com.au. Cool. Um, I'll put that and up. And we will have the, the college. Uh, I'll tell you where we're up to with the college. We're building yep. the website. We're building the website. Um, Andrew and I have already started um, uh, putting content onto the website. It's not officially um, active yet, mm. um, uh, but Andrew and I have been doing one podcast a week. Yeah, he uh, so told me. Have, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, that's have, awesome. Yeah. That's insane. And, 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 and guys, this, um, this podcast, I'll, I'll make this, I'll put this podcast on the website as well. Awesome. Um, uh, and, um, but we want to build. We want to just get a bit of content up there uh, first. We want to get some landmark um, research papers. Um, so the website's in construction phase. Um, that website will also serve as our own peer-reviewed journal. Even express how frustrating it is. Like either journals are too expensive, like thousands and oh, thousands or thousands tens of thousands to get your or more, reviewed, yep. or they have their own bias and they don't want anyone 
submitting anything that's of scientific worth. A uh, very yeah. frustrating place in history for our biases and scientific research. Very frustrating. It's very, it's very hard to get this type of um, this type of movement theory work uh, published. Um, and I, you know, I've collected ODIs and pain scores on all of my patients that have done neurohab. Right. And I've collected that data and sent manuscripts to, you know, uh, rehabilitation and musculoskeletal journals. And every time, despite having that really hard objective data of, of gains, they just go movement dysfunction. What's that? Never heard of it. I don't, yeah. I don't know what you're talking about. The editors yeah. are just, it just won't get published. Because they probably move crap themselves. <laughs> <laughs> they don't know what it is because they move shit. Like, they don't you know? understand it. They don't understand it. So they just come back with these really weird responses. And they, I think they say they're sort of afraid that it's going to undermine their readership mm. by because their readership does not understand movement either. So how could you possibly publish something that tells tells the physiotherapy industry that they need to learn how to move correctly well it makes them very <laughs> obsolete doesn't it and it's, it's very uh, challenging to them and their profession because i mean they've already taken a big hit with like deep tissue cross friction massage for the use of like scar tissue and stuff like the research has already come out and pretty much blown that out of the window so a lot of physio that they're trying to move towards movement and exercise but they're doing a poor job at it in my opinion um, but every profession has psychology they, they, they love oh, yeah. bias on social yeah. Um, they're, they're suddenly becoming, they're, they're suddenly having more uh, education about psychology yeah. than biomechanics. Screw that. I mean, can people even assess anymore? Are we just going to look at someone and take a quick history of five, 10 minutes and then say they've got non-specific back pain? It just seems like an absolute cop-out. When there are people that can do it, how can you say it's not possible? When I know so many doctors, physios, chiros, and people around that understand how to do proper specific assessments and find proper diagnosis, especially with our back issues, how can they say it doesn't exist? But they carry on with their own little echo chamber and they just talk, 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 and they get the same thing back. And anyone that challenges them gets blocked. Anyone that challenges them gets called an idiot and pushed away, you know? And so it's very difficult online right now to find common ground with people. It's very dif difficult to even have a respectful conversation. If you disagree with someone, they're immediately attacking you, you know? And just all because you disagree over, you know, the fact that, hey, I think, I agree with McGill and you don't. And then all of a sudden they're threatening your life. And sometimes it gets really, really bad, really, really bad. And it's very yeah. disappointing to see that, you know, because I feel like as medical professionals, we should be able to come together, remain positive. We can challenge each other, but we can do it in a way that's positive. Have, have, have open discussions and, and debates. One of the uh, organizers, one of the directors of the Institute of Musculoskeletal Health mm. in uh, New South Wales, they run an annual a seminar i think it's called over treatment or something like that and i i wanted to speak at the event and have open discourse and be be subject to questions and they wouldn't let me speak mm. they wouldn't let me speak no, it's yep. crazy they do not want to allow us to have any airtime because the moment we have a bit of airtime the things that we're claiming are so profoundly simple fundamental and logical that everyone just agrees like yep. that makes sense absolutely myself aaron and andrew were about to release a paper and some of the things we're talking about in there just in the discussion even and talking and bringing in a couple of other papers and talking about those as well it does seem like common sense why are we trying to fight this when it seems like it really is common sense but we've gotten to this point where people are so focused on the psychosocial that we've forgotten the bio i think steven put it really well one time on the podcast talking about all of these new grads you know they come out they graduate and they're looking for like a messiah looking for someone to lead them and they fall mm. astray when they find these people on social media that they're kind of leading them down a route that's so psychosocial and the, give them their ability. They might have, you know, they might have 50,000 subscribers on their, on their Instagram or um, yeah. YouTube or whatever, but those 50,000 subscribers, they're all kind of looking for someone to validate why they can't fix someone up. Yeah. Right. And, exactly. and if you say, if you tell someone the reason your patients are not getting better is because they've got a psychological problem. That makes you feel good. Okay, that, that removes yeah, your you can't accountability. Do anything for that. Exactly. It's not my fault that I'm a crap therapist. It's the yeah. patient's fault that they're not getting better because they've got depression or they're, they've got anxiety. Or it, it removes the level of accountability yeah, yeah. from the industry. 
You know, and it's just like, wow, are you are you that content to be so underperforming in your career for your whole entire life and you can't fix someone's back pain? And you're happy to blame it on them. People are just yeah. so set in their bias and um, so set in their ways and not not willing to concede. And it's funny because I try to keep myself as open as possible to new research. And there was something that came across my Facebook the other day, and it was about central nervous fatigue, central nervous system fatigue. And um, I had had it wrong for a long time. There's a lot of new research out on central nervous fatigue, believe it or not. And uh, so I read the literature and I changed my mind. And now me and Aaron are writing a blog about it so that other people can learn about the new research and how central nervous fatigue and how quickly it dissipates compared to what we were taught in the, you know, the last 20, 30 years. So being able to change your mind is not a weakness. Get all your manuscripts together. And um, yeah, we're working, and we're we're working hard. <laughs> and they will be peer reviewed. We'll select our, um, we'll select our peer review reviewing committee Um and and we'll give feedback, but it'll get published. It'll get published where it's more widely widely available and and um, able to be accessed by the private health organisations, private insurers, mm. um, uh, public health departments. That's how we're going to be able to bring about change. These guys, these these guys who have been in charge, they've been doing it for too long. They've had their turn. They've failed miserably. It is really time yep. for them to step aside and let people who understand biomechanics have a go. We know that we're going to start to make a difference because we already are independently. That's not enough to solve the epidemic. We need to collaborate. Mm. No, it's been a fantastic podcast. Thank you so much once again for coming on and gracing us with your time. We really appreciate it. I've definitely learned a lot. Like I said, we could go on and on and on. Thanks for waiting up, Stephen. I really appreciate talking to you guys. I am absolutely positive we're going to have a lot more uh, interactions in future and, and hopefully in person as well. Yeah. Um, we have to do some workshops together here in Brisbane or in NZ. Yep. Can't wait. We need you to come over and uh, teach us in New Zealand. We need it. No, hey, okay, thank Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Yes, and, uh, thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, guys. See you later. Join us as we explore evidence-based practice, manual medicine, and sports science through the lens of movement, strength, performance, and overall health.